Welcome to episode 185 of A Pint with Shawnee B and the Don, as it's now being called, because the Don is celebrating probably her 20th or so, I've made that figure up, appearance on A Pint with Shawnee B. She's very much my co-host and wing woman. Good day, sir. How are you? Ash, you know yourself, tearing away like a tinker's vest. Our last uh, podcast got a bit of flack, as ever, from our American friends, and, you know, uh, as if to prove us wrong... Uh, we, we spent la- much of the last uh, podcast talking about the Uvalde school slaughter that happened and has been picked over in the last uh, month. And as if to uh, make the shithole country, as I call it, worse, not only did uh, New York introduce a permit to free carry guns, which was going to be hilarious. I've lived in New York for three years and... Uh, Certainly wandering around that with every weirdo and jock carrying a gun is going to be hilarious. We may come back to the gun thing a little bit later, but we are going to stick with America because for most of the world and so most of my life and the Don's life, America has been, as Boris Johnson in an interview this morning with Jake Tapper of CNN, during which he quoted the Fonz, he said, correct mundo. Did he say that or did he say, correct mundo? He said, correct mundo. Uh, He was agreeing with something that uh, Jake Tapper said to him. And Jake Tapper called him and said, well, you're quoting the Fonz now. As if Boris Johnson's government hasn't already jumped the shark. Uh, We over in this neck of the woods are waiting for what I think will be the inevitable. And we will probably end up doing, uh, for all the Americans who go, why don't you talk about your own country? Why why are you always talking about us? Um, but Boris Johnson called America a shining light, a sh- shining citadel or a city on the hill, which it has been known for during most of my life. America has always been the place where innovation and technology and faith in humanity and faith in democracy and faith in doing the right thing, admittedly a lot of it couched in uh, propaganda and uh, self-serving wars and stuff like that. But the place is in front of the world's eyes, in my opinion, just disintegrating and collapsing like a flan in a cupboard. And we had, just before this podcast on uh, Thursday last, the denouement, the final nail in the coffin for Roe versus Wade, which brings abortion right front and centre again. The Don, uh, many of you may not know, is a quite famous activist in Ireland. She, she well, you were during, during the uh, Irish referendum in 2018. The Don was known as Repeal O'Neill and she did a very uh, visually out there campaign to uh, push for a repeal of the Eighth Amendment, which was carried by a 66-33 majority, which is known as a landslide. We'll come back to those 66-33 figures later in the podcast. But uh, as an advocate uh, of the woman's right to choose and as an activist for abortion to be permitted in countries, how did you feel? Obviously not a bit surprised. I don't think anybody can be surprised. I mean, we, we, it was coming. It, somebody had made the thing that it's almost like the death of a parent. You know, it's coming, but you're not ready for how it feels when it happens. And I, so I get that. I get that people are devastated. But what's kind of taken me aback over the past day or two is the level to which people were not prepared. I suppose like because I was so interested in abortion rights and from an Irish perspective, the American situation had a huge bearing on our situation. So like you had to learn about it. It wasn't just focus on Irish Catholic issues and what happened with us. So the Eighth Amendment in Ireland came in in 1983, equating a mother's life to the unborn, which is interesting because that phrase had never been used before. It means the fetus has rights as a human. Yeah, and, it, born, and yeah. the thing is, Abortion was illegal in Ireland anyway, but there was a fear that it was becoming, in a lot of countries, it was becoming legalised. Because like, it wasn't, in America, it wasn't, it wasn't really a partisan issue. It wasn't all Democrats versus Republicans. Like Joe Biden was not a fan of Roe versus Wade. Ronald Reagan was pro-choice. So that kind of happened later. And a lot of the abortion activists were, in fact, Christian churches trying to access abortion for their parishioners. When you stand back and look at it, there's a huge amount of, right, we'll get the Catholics in and we're going to be pro-life, anti-abortion. Ireland was used as this beacon of that's Holy Catholic Ireland. So it was kind of an awful lot of American money pumped in and pumped to Spock, which was the big organisation at the time, which would in later years be basically the Iona Institute. 
But so American interests have always been involved in the pro-life movement in Ireland. So it was really important for us as Irish abortion activists that we would look at that and be aware of that. When you look at the American situation, it was never it was never great. Roe versus Wade was handy, but it wasn't it wasn't good enough. At any point, the idea that the Supreme Court, who are unelected people, can do this, that's not good enough. Because so American women have been sitting there for 50 years going, this is a constitutional right. But it was always precarious. And you have to kind of ask yourself, why was it not protected more? There was 50 years to do it. I think there are religious zealots, but I don't think the powers that be actually give a flying fuck about the babies or about pregnancy or about abortion. I don't think, I think it's a political football and it's a convenient one. And if you're going to say that, you have to acknowledge that for Democrats, it's a handy political football as well, because if women didn't need you to defend them, then they don't need your vote. As an Irish person for the past 10 years watching it closely, we're kind of going, Jesus, you're very comfortable there at Roe versus Wade as if that couldn't come down like a mm. ton of bricks. Mm. It's very easy to do. It's weird for me to see how genuinely shocked people are and see how ill-organized they are. And like I've been on the internet and kind of passing comment and having pro-choice people being very angry at me. And I'm going, I'm not trying to be an arsehole, but like get your ducks in a row. Things like what we've had to do for years we had the right to travel after a while. So organising... That meant travelling to the UK to have an abortion. Yeah, so organising... it under the carpet, basically. Yeah, but organising that people would be able to travel. Organising that we could get abortion pills in. That was, you know, there was an awful lot of networks doing that. And it's almost like they have no idea how to do this. And I'm seeing all over the internet women from states where abortion will still be legal or women from Canada or from all around... For, for instance, Canada, it's, you know, if you like, they were using the analogy of poutine. So if you like poutine and you're in a no poutine state, you're very welcome to come and visit us here in Canada. I, you can come and stay What's with poutine? me. The Canadian dish. Oh, poutine. Poutine, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you're very welcome to stay with me. <laughs> okay. I'll find you a very nice poutine restaurant. I'll, code. I'll drive you there. I'll look after you afterwards. We can have ice cream afterwards. It's no problem. And, and it's lovely. And mm. there, there's also camping or Gambling yeah. is legal in Nevada. You're welcome to come and stay with me while you gamble. I'll look after you afterwards. It's fine. You know, yeah. That's lovely. But I'm looking at that going, okay, in Ireland, we had all of these bogus crisis pregnancy agencies, which were just fucking pro-life zealots that would get girls in and terrorize them and, and show them these videos that were full of lies and shit. And, but they would be, they would be masquerading as pro-choice. And that was awful. But we didn't like in Ireland we didn't have certainly not in my lifetime we didn't have a load of young people that really gave a shit there were plenty of young people who might have been against abortion but not invested but if you look at America there are so many young people and college age activists Mm. that are heavily involved in the pro-life movement and so when it when it comes to um underground movements and how do we get abortion pills to people and you know finding you someone to go and stay with to access that that's much more dangerous because when you ring up these phone lines in ireland you get some fucking l codger and it was easier for us to kind of go let's flood their website let's take it take Mm. it down let's flood their phone lines it's a lot more dangerous like the only young people here were fucking weirdos you'd spot them a mile off that's Mm. the reality and also we don't have guns Mm. so it's it's a different situation there but some of the same some of the same things are applicable and i do think American women who want to set things up should look to Ireland, should look to people outside and say, how did you do this? Should look to women on waves. How did you safely get the abortion pills in? How, how did you set up, set up those things? But they should also be aware there are different dangers to us. Mm. And it's just, it's kind of mind blowing that when I was, I was discussing this on a few different internet forums and they were just genuine, they were, they were like, oh my God, thanks so much. Can you add us to this group? And how did you do this? And how did you do that? And it was, I suppose, because they've had the privilege for 50 years, it was just, you know, you take a right for granted. They, mm. they didn't grasp how quickly it could be taken away. Well, I mean, it's astonishing to me, the theocracy issue. I mean, going all the way back to Trump emerging from Obama and the Catholic Church, particularly in America, and one of the fastest growing churches in the world is Pentecostal Christianity, which is a kind of a fundamentalist religion based on the Holy Spirit and talking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, all that all shit. that kind of stuff. And that's not just white, that's quite black, actually. Mm-hmm. It's quite, you know, it's, it's a, a, a clap, clappy hand kind of religion. But there's this religion, religious theocracy who rode in behind a guy like Donald Trump who is going straight to hell, let's face it, a mortal sinner, uh, if you want to start talking their language, 
a philanderer, a man lacking in any humanity towards other human beings, and not ticking any boxes in terms of religious ardor. I mean, you can argue Mike Pence maybe does, and probably Joe Biden does, mm. but they they not only rode him behind him, they had him painted as this kind of Christ-like figure who was coming to save the day. And we're talking about, I don't know, maybe 30, 40% of American people here. Yeah, I think there's a thing of, he's not the hero that we wanted or expected, but he's obviously the hero we needed. Yeah, and so it's not like Jesus would send some lunatic, you know, just to stand. Like, you can make up anything. You, can, you could argue Hitler, I'm sure, was a fucking saviour. My people probably did at the time. But there's a, I, there's a quote I wanted to read here and get your opinion on it, and I haven't shown you this, which was from a pastor, David Battenhart, uh, on Facebook. And he says, quote, The unborn are a convenient group of people to advocate for. They never make demands of you. They are morally uncomplicated, unlike the incarcerated, addicted, or the chronically poor. They don't re- resent your condescension or complain that you are not politically correct. Unlike widows, they don't ask you to question patriarchy. Unlike orphans, they don't need money, education, or childcare. Unlike aliens, they don't bring all that racial, cultural, and religious baggage that you so dislike. They allow you to feel good about yourself without any work at creating or maintaining relationships. And when they are born, you can forget about them because they cease to be unborn. It's almost as if by being born, they have died to you. You can love the unborn and advocate for them without substantially challenging your own wealth, power or privilege, without reimagining social structures, apologising or making reparations to anyone. They are, in short, the perfect people to love if you want to claim you love Jesus, but actually dislike people who breathe. Prisoners, immigrants, the sick, the poor, widows, orphans, all the groups that are specifically mentioned in the Bible, they all get thrown under the bus for the unborn. I'm laughing that you brought that up because I had that ready to read. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're so right. So when we no. do this, we, we come up with topics and we just literally go into a room and so yeah, we, we might surprise say, each other. We might stuff. say we'll chat about such and such, but obviously like it's yeah, not, it's not very good. If we have the chat well, beforehand, it's no point. Yeah. No, I came across it, uh, I think it's a couple great, of months ago and I thought it was really, really well done. And it's, it, 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 it was very much my thoughts for a long time, but it was well put together. It was the convenient yeah. group to advocate for. But no, it's, it's gas that you... I came across that as well. Because I think when we, I mean, I certainly remember, I mean, I have touch wood never got into the situation where I've had to face down an abortion or not situation with a, with a, a partner. But when, when we started dating five years ago, uh, you know, I was smack bang in the middle of it suddenly with you. And I remember talking to some friends like... Sorry, just to clarify, I didn't need an abortion at the time. No, I was... no, when, I, when we started dating, but because the Don was an activist, I started having to sort of get feign interest because I wanted to have sex with her. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, uh, I had to uh, get, get sort of jammed up on it. And of course, nobody likes abortion, including people who are pro-choice. But, you know, it's been happening since time immemorial. And I used to... T- I have a number of friends here in Dublin who are mid-50s, still weirdly... Uh, religious and go chanting at mass and make up all sorts of bullshit as to why their faith is 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 genuine and shouldn't be uh, questioned. But you know, I said to those people, you 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 pointed out earlier in the podcast about how long it took for Ireland to get to a referendum on the Eighth Amendment. So all of these pro life people knew for about twenty years that there was a movement within this country away from theology, away from the church, mm. and away from this dogma. And into a sort of a much more kind of liberal way of, of respecting people's right to choose. And, and, and gay marriage came into that. And there's talk about that being on the chopping block next in America. But I said to them, "You, these people are wealthy. Where's all your money going for creating the greatest place to not have an abortion? Where are the bona fide, non-religious, genuinely decent places where a woman can walk in off the street and if she wants to go left for abortion or right for adoption or left for fo- or whatever it is, that it's all laid out in a very fair and honest way mm. in nine or ten locations around the country, which would be privately funded by these religious people. And we would have better adoption. We would have better all these things, better options for women. And not go in, as you said, and get browbeaten with videos and, and mm. told that they're committing a mortal sin. Well, None absolutely. of that happened. I mean, like... We've made this point before. I made a discussion with a friend of yours who would be of the opposite opinion and would be pro-life. And I actually, in, in good faith, had said, look, regardless of which way the referendum goes, 
if you actually want to do something, now you might be doing it from a point of view of you want to save the unborn. I'm doing it because I want to make life manageable for women who choose or have to have a baby. It doesn't matter what's what's in our hearts as to why we're interested. The point is we can have a common goal. And I would happily have gone in. But the obvious one from an Irish perspective anyway, because I was a young girl that got pregnant and had not planned to have children and the options weren't there. And I did fall into the poverty trap. So I can, if, if you're looking just from the economic point of view of, let's say, some young one, 18, 19, 20, whatever, gets pregnant, wasn't in her plan, how is she going to manage? Is her life going to be derailed? If you actually care about the unborn, it's not about punishing women. Okay, so why all of this money? And there's a huge amount of money that came from America. Why was that money all put into activism and propaganda, but no money was put into, in, in an Irish setting, the number one problem is childcare. Like I was on the lone parents. It was said to me, I, why wouldn't you, you know, go back to work like as soon as the kids start at school? Now when they start school, they're in from what, like half nine till two. Great. Mm. Okay. I, had no, I hadn't finished secondary school. I had no work experience or education. So how am I going to waltz into a job and say I'm available for it? So half nine. So if the job is local enough, uh, from 10 in the morning, I'll be available, but I'll have to get away by half one at the latest. And can you pay me enough? Mind you, after COVID, you probably do that now. Well, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So the, the number one thing, and then as the kids get older even, you can't just like drop them in the middle of the road and say, play with the buses. Mm. So, th- But there was always, and whenever I had this discussion with somebody, what would come down to at the very, no matter how long they'd waffle on for, the very end was, would your mad not just mind them for you? So the assumption that you have childcare. So if you actually gave a shit and you wanted life to be manageable and for life not to be cancelled because just because a girl got pregnant, look, we can help you. We can help you build a life. Or you want women not to choose abortion. Fucking obvious one. Help set up creches. Help set up childcare Mm. so that girls and women can go back to their education or can work because childcare is is a second mortgage. Mm. Like Ireland is a it is a decent welfare state. There are supports, but unless you can find a job that's going to pay a lot more than what childcare costs, then you have no choice. You're in a poverty trap and that's the reality. So, I mean, you can't fix everything, but like they could easily have set up uh, family centres where there's crashes, but also that there's a nurse there, that there's a counsellor that we, look, we can sort you out, we can help you out, that there's a social worker there or yeah. some, not even a qualified social worker as such, but somebody that helps you through all of the citizen's advice stuff, all of the things that you might be entitled to, all the little helps, the schemes that, because there there's a million and one things. They didn't do that. So, the, but the thing, the, the, the thing I'm trying to get at here is that let, and let's take Ireland as the 52nd state of America, which it often is, is referred to, especially over here in Europe, that the hierarchy of religion in this country is very wealthy. The church is very wealthy. The church actually has an awful lot of property and has lots of money. And the people like my friends who are still religious you know, the great thing about Catholicism over here is you can cherry pick it. It's not as biblically, uh, you know, infallible as, as it is over in some religions in America. You can pick and choose and it gives you a lovely, warm feeling for making money and making all the money that you make and how you're doing God's work and all this kind of stuff. And so people are able to sort of go to sleep and like, oh, yeah, I don't need to give that much to the poor. I'm doing you know, poor deserve their thing. But there's this, it then becomes quite sinister. If you have the teachings of Christ and you have the kind of looking after people and caring, that there's this fracture between action, and this could all be done privately. This could be done with all the weird, my weird friends who are all very well off, and they they could build these things and make it. But they don't do that, and nor do they even help or advocate for children who are in orphanages or who are being... And yet the church here is known for Magdalene Laundries, which is where women who were, fell pregnant back in the last century, got sent to these horrific conditions, written out of their family and sent to places run by nuns and treated appallingly and often often abused. And often, well, they sold their kids to, Amer- to Americans. Well, they sold their kids many times to Americans on the, you know, at the back door, which, uh, you know, when I was in China in, in 2003 was happening to the tune of 50,000 kids being found in a warehouse in, in outside Guangzhou. And, or maybe it was 5,000 kids, but it was, it was 5 or 50, it wasn't 500. And, um, you know, this is what just gets my goat. It's, we talk about hypocrisy a lot, a lot on this, and we talk about hypocrisy a lot in terms of the church. Where are you? Where are you, church? Where are you, Catholics, when this sort of stuff gets real? And where they are is they're in America, they're outside abortion clinics shouting murder at women going in with guns hanging off their, 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 shoulders 
That's where they're at. Yeah. That's where they're, that's where, don't kill young babies. When babies yeah. get born, we don't really give a shit about what happens to them, but don't kill them. Yeah, and by the way, the abortion clinics are not just abortion clinics, they're reproductive health clinics. Yeah. So we don't want you to get pregnant and be an unmarried mother because then you're the worst in the world. We don't want you to get an abortion. But when you're going in and you're working your tits off and there's not great benefits in America and you're just trying to get by and you want to get your contraception, we're going to get in the way of that as well. We're going to do everything we can to block contraception for you, to make sure it's not affordable for you, to make sure you can't access it. And then we're going to terrorise you when you go in looking for a contraception so that you don't fall pregnant because mm. you can't afford it and you're trying to do your best. No matter what you're wrong, it's almost like it's not about the babies. It's about shaming women for daring to have any sexuality at all. But by the way, if you don't bow down to men, you're not performing your duties either. So we want you to be we want you to be sex objects, but you're not to have autonomy in your own sexuality. We yeah. can't have you enjoying that. It's a morality thing. And the, the other point about it, where, where I got to with my journey on the whole repeal thing was the thing's unenforceable anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm, the Americans are are, are, are are getting very scared about about the threat to prison and arrest and all that stuff, which I, I suppose is is something that would probably start happening in some of the more austere states. But it's, it's very hard to enforce. And certainly in this country, we, took, we turned a blind eye to women travelling. We had a referendum for the right to travel. We also had a referendum for the right to information. Because if you remember, back in the days when magazine zines were a thing, so we'd have the English magazines. In the back of the girls' and women's magazines, there'd be abortion clinics and stuff. And those pages were torn out in Ireland. You couldn't have those. <laughs> like, there used to be an officer in Trinity College that you'd go to and you'd say... I need to get a number for England. I need, like, I'm in trouble. This is before the internet. And they would have to say to you in, in the students' union sort of place, absolutely not. That is illegal. We can't give you that sort of information. Absolutely not. Now, if you happened upon that information in such and such a cafe around the corner in about 15 minutes, it wouldn't be our fault if somebody happened to have yeah, that information. Yeah. But don't ever ask us that yeah. again. And they literally had to do that. With ways around. To get you a number so you can get to a phone box to ring this number. So, like... Like since the Eighth Amendment came in in 1983, every single referendum we had since then loosened it. We did have the constitutional right to travel. But before that, it, like that would have been an issue as well. Yeah. So that's a concern in terms of how they make sure that the right to travel is kept up in the US. Mm. You know, at least they have the Internet, but that brings its own dangers. So, you know, just going back to the start. So Trump arrives, he gets, I mean, the shame of a Catholic, you know, in my view, backing him. And backing him just because he might fix Roe versus Wade, which amazingly he did. I mean, it was a 6-3 vote and he put three ridiculously conservative stooges on the Supreme Court. So he played with the jurisprudence of America and it worked. Mm. And let's not forget that Obama wasn't allowed to nominate someone because it was too close to his term. And so that's what's happened. And to your shame, Catholics, you know, to your absolute shame. What I want to try to get at, though, is why is this happening? Why... Why is America crumbling and dividing? And I think where I'm coming to, and, it, you know, this, the, the Americans, I think, may disagree with me on this, is that it really does come down to the idea of displacement and racism. I mean, you can argue that abortion is probably, you know, that the unwed and in trouble mothers are possibly more likely to be persons of colour or in America. That's, you could probably argue that. Well, you'd certainly could argue that uh, the conditions are not the same in terms of access to contraception. So Correct. you're 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 more you're more right. you're more likely to be in trouble to use the Irish phrase. So maybe I fall down on that argument because if you are if you're the white middle class evangelical Trump supporting gun toting American, which is uh, which is only about thirty percent of the population, it has to be remembered. But if you're trying to protect white America. You know, because we're trying to protect it, marching under the banner of Christ. Um, yeah, the race, the the the, uh, the relationship between race and abortion in America is is quite interesting, and I've heard a lot of different takes on it. But in the early nineteen hundreds, so abortion was legal in America, and then the doctors started getting their knickers in a twist because midwives were stepping on their toes, and who do they think they are? But in the early nineteen hundreds, there was a huge concern about abortion because the most people who accessed abortion were moneyed and white. And there were actual ads in the newspaper from Physicians Against Abortion sort of thing, imploring Protestant men that it was their duty to make sure that their white women were having babies regularly, lest they be outnumbered by blacks and Catholics and other undesirables. 
So that's where the, a huge push in, in America in, in the 20th, in the early 20th century was about this fear. And I, and I know people talk about it from the other position because with slavery, uh, slave owners weren't big on abortion because they didn't like their property not multiplying. Uh, but right. a, a huge amount of the push was actually concern that white Protestant women weren't going to be having as many babies. They were going to want to control how many babies they had because in the 19th century, the average woman had six pregnancies. And that was going down because, you know, yeah. and in Ireland, you'd say, you know, the gentleman's family or the prodigy family is a girl and a boy. Yeah. So that's what that's all you'd want. So that's where it actually had come from. But then if you look at when abortion became the big kind of political football, it replaced segregation. If you look so at, we're talking the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah. So if you, because I mean, back to the point that it wasn't, it wasn't among party lines before that, but then suddenly it was. And you're kind of going, they don't, it's not about the fucking, they just need a political football. And we can't, we can't shout so about. What are they trying to achieve? I think it's tribalism. So it is about protecting white America. I think that was a huge thing at, at a certain time, but I think it's more tribalism. I think from a political point of view, so the question is, what are they trying to achieve? Well, it depends who they are. Yeah. Well, I'm um, talking, let's just broaden it. Let's just say Republicans. I, I, conservative America. I think the Republican push for pro-life was always political. It was like, we'll get the Catholic what vote. What does that mean in this instance? We'll get the Catholic vote. Okay. You have to stand for something. We're okay. going to stand for that. And, and also, to be fair, I think the Democrats only give a flying fuck about reproductive justice because they want to be the defenders of reproductive justice. Yeah. So understand, no one really gives a flying fuck about you and your situation. And that's not being kind of, oh, nobody cares, but it's about being realistic. That's back to my point that the Democrats could well have done more in all that time to make sure that reproductive justice was not precarious. But they didn't, because if it was never precarious, then women wouldn't have needed them to defend them. That's something to be voted for. So the, the, so the approach that you get when you encounter a very religious white American, and, and it's worth remembering, by the way, folks, that many of these are Irish. Don't kid yourself. Irish American. Yeah, don't kid yourself. We talked about septic tanks last time, but there's a huge, particularly down in places like Atlanta and in Boston, New York, there's a huge sort of plastic Irish, very religious, moneyed crew who are behind a lot of this. The, the Sean Hannity's of this world, the Mike Flynn's of this world, a lot of Trump's backroom staff were of Irish descent. So, you know, it's easy to point our but finger, I mean, that but comes they're, back they're, they have to, a bit of us in them. That comes back to when the Irish Catholics became white. Yeah, yeah. Because we went over as the blacks of... Yeah, yeah. When, and even to what I was talking about in those ads, it, it was that we blacks and Catholics and other undesirables. You know, there was this, this problem with the Irish Americans, and it's sorry, not all Irish Americans, obviously, but that, that there's a definite kind of Republican conservative streak. And what that really is, it's like... And I'm not trying to get into the kind of identity politics, oppression Olympics thing. But if you look at the oppression pyramid, there's always this thing of why do certain women, why are they such fucking pick me's? Stand behind men no matter what and never defend their own because look, I'm not like other girls. I'm a great, I'm a cool girl. There's that shit. And you have that, you know, with the Uncle Tom thing. With the Irish, you have that, that as soon as they became white and respectable, very quick to shit on the people below them. The Italians as well. Yeah. yeah. That's um, that's what that, that's a na- nasty thing about human nature. Yeah, and also the the, you know, the nastiness of all this, and all dressed up in, under a crucifix is just mind boggling. But we have recent Gallup poll figures this month in America say thirty percent of Americans are pro life and fifty four percent are pro choice, and the rest are undecided. And that fifty four percent is growing. Um, on the gun situation, there's about 360 million people in America and there's 400 million guns and 30% of Americans have a gun and 60% don't, although 50% of Americans claim to live in a gun household where there is a gun in the house, but daddy owns it yeah. or whatever, right? Numbers for Republicans are something like, uh, and these figures are loose, and if I've got them wrong, I apologize. I don't have them written down. But the Republican numbers are something like 50% are gun owners and only 18% of Democrats, right? And Mm. 64% of Republicans live in a gun family. So you have this 60-30 thing happening, which, remember, in our country was considered a landslide. Yeah. So you have 30% of people, 30% of people believe the American election was stolen 30% of the people are still 
banging the Donald Trump drum, and that's a low, that's a low number. That's you, mm. you can't get like. So if if these minor, this is a, a the, the, it's as if all the people in Ireland got actually hijacked by the pro life people, yeah. and they were running the show here, which they probably were, by the way, for decades up to the referendum. So you have this, you have this thirty sixty thing, which I'm predicting now. November elections coming up in America. This is going to be one of the greatest referendums on what America actually is and what it wants to be. There's talk of secession from Texas, from California. There's talk about the thing falling apart, which it could. But there's a, it could backfire because now is the time to say, do we want it? The next election, I just wrote a few things here, is going to be about abortion, bullshit conspiracy theories peddled by Donald Trump, out of control gun situation, Freedom of speech, Twitter and all that kind of stuff and cancer culture, racism, Black Lives Matter, and uh, Christian fundamentalism. What do you want to be, America? And actually, it's got so divisive that there's a fracture there where a lot of people might go, we don't want to be friends anymore and we mm-hmm. don't want to be in the same state. Yeah, I think like, as I was listening to you quote the figures even, I was kind of looking at that. Like I've, I've, I was watching, I had a look through yesterday over the past three or four decades what the percentage was in terms of who was pro-choice and who was like who was, who was pro-life and who was undecided and the issue there was that well what does pro-choice mean and what does pro-life mean i mean there's a huge difference regardless of what your personal opinion is but you have to acknowledge that there's a huge difference between somebody saying um i'm pro-life in all circumstances no matter what i'm pro-life in cases of the mother being in danger or in cases of rape then you have some people saying look i don't like abortion but you know I'm okay, I'm pro-choice insofar as up to 12 weeks, but after that, fuck off. Then you have other people who are, you know, so it's there There are nuances. There are, there right, but you can probably say that those numbers are probably about 30, 54 at the moment, I don't know. I think. The thing is, I find every time it's asked, it's asked in a very difficult way because right. I, think, I think there's a huge fucking difference in the amount of Americans that would support the Irish system that, okay, look, abortion is available, but up until a certain point, and in special circumstances, up until a late, later point for medical reasons, but not blanket open, blanket open door, yeah. uh, late term, all that kind of stuff. Mm. If you look at people who aren't heavily invested in one side or the other, don't have strong opinions, most people would go, oh, well, I don't know about, I wouldn't like to think people could walk in at 26 weeks, yeah, but, well, you know, that that's yeah, kind of... Do you know what I mean? It's clumsily asked, and you can make figures say what you want them to say. Like, the American question... Look, they're a very strange democracy anyway, including the ones that don't want to say they're a democracy, but they're a democratic republic. Okay, mm-hmm. very strange. The whole system of the Supreme Court is fucking weird. And it's kind of, look, the whole setup was never designed to be all that democratic. It was always insidiously designed to make sure things would go a certain way. But when it was designed, nobody could have foreseen what life would be like in 2022 with the internet, how polarised politics have, and identity politics have become everywhere, but especially in America, where it's literally fucking designed that way. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about referendum, they don't have referendums and things. Like, we had a referendum, so it's a case of it doesn't really matter whether you're a Fianna Fáil household or a Fianna Gael. It doesn't really matter. It's what you think. Mm. And it's listen to the debates that go on, listen to the conversation that's happening within the country, and you go and vote with your conscience. That shit doesn't happen in America, and I don't think that's by accident. But, but uh, yes, and I agree. And this, the Supreme Court has been tarnished now, I think, not, not because of the decision that they took, but because the decision flies in the face of public opinion. The, the, this Overton window, they talk about what's considered to be the zeitgeist of a nation. Mm. And what's, you know, and, and it is not a collapsing of Roe versus Way or a removal of gay rights or any of that sort of shit, mm. which is where they're moving it. So this smaller minority, Christian, fundamentalist, white, gun-toting army of people are holding sway that, over where this great democracy on the hill is going. Yeah, and I think they're probably getting an awful lot out of the fact that there's a cultural zeitgeist on the left, this small minority that believe it quite extreme things, deciding that absolutely everybody has to go along with exactly what we say, pick yeah. your side, you're in or you're out, yeah. in or out donkey, the friend, the, the enemy of my friend kind of shit, all of that, that, that tribalism, mm. but it's happening on a, on a cultural basis on the left. It's this tribalism that, that is like America's designed for it. It's mm. literally designed for it, but it's happening everywhere. I mean, I don't agree with the Christian right in any way, shape or form. I tend to lean left. There's an awful lot of shit I d- disagree with, with identity politics and with 
kind of the woke culture and what we've decided are, are the correct thing. But the issue is you have to pick your tribe and you'll be castigated if you don't but pick your side. The more extreme, the better. But there's also a lack of integrity there because it's human nature that, that we can be tribalistic and stuff. But like I constantly, when I listen to people or read from people that I, I'm interested in and I tend to like their take, I'm constantly, because I'm aware of this, I'm constantly questioning myself and saying, no, Darren, what do you disagree with him over? I get concerned if there's somebody I admire and I don't yet know what I disagree with them on because that's a problem because well, I, mean, like, I don't know anyone that I don't, that I, that there's nothing I disagree with them on. So it's a fucking problem if you can't establish a difference you have with somebody you admire and want to hear their take on things, then you need to ask yourself, are you thinking critically? Well, I mean, the best example there, I suppose, recently is Sam Harris, who we talk about quite a bit in this podcast, who is a great podcast uh, and I've been listening to him for 10 years and he's a rock of knowledge and sense on most things. His podcast is called The Making Sense Podcast. But Sam Harris likes to pull a gun out and shoot it every now and then and he's couching his love of guns and trying to trying to rationalize uh, why we need i mean he does say things like it, it needs to be akin to getting a pilot's license to own a gun so he does mm-hmm. i mean he is on the right side of it but you can hear he likes his gun he likes going to the gun club and you know if there's 400 million guns someone needs to say we are going to half that in five years and we're going to half it again in 10 years and there has to be a program put into place. I mean, Sam Harris says there's five million people in America who will go to war if their guns are taken off them. Well, let's let's let those five million guns go for the time because most of those people probably are hunters and 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 and, and very responsible gun owners. But let's get rid of the let's get let's try and half them. But there's all this stuff caught up, you know, as people with multiple guns and arsenal, a whole cabinet full of them. It's like um, if you wanted to remove Formula One or something because of the climate this big circus going around burning carbon just for what for a motor race that lasts mm. three days you'd have people up in arms about it so to speak but like we need to get you know the same way that 9-11 suddenly everyone had to take their shoes off going through airport security and their belts off and we all did that yeah and that was 3,000 people died and then the other thing that they do is that well, we're not as bad as x or y countries yeah they're, and they're talking about like Honduras and Guatemala and Mexico but like all of Europe is looking at America on the gun thing going what the fuck lads Come up with something. And they've got, they've, by the way, the good news Americans, and, and one in two people who listen to this podcast are in America. Yeah. Uh, and, and we do occasionally get feedback, oh, why do you concentrate on us so much? And we concentrate on you because what's going on there historically is coming to a cinema near us in the next five to ten years, and we've got to watch out for it. Yeah, um, usually in, in terms of ideology and stuff, yeah. anything that becomes widespread, I, I have it counted as between four and six years yeah. is the current. Yeah, and we, we have Boris Johnson, who's a bit Trumpish, and we have Sinn Féin, who are a bit Trumpish, coming on our agenda here in Ireland. I would um, disagree with you on that, but carry on. Well, they're populist, um, and, and I think they're sinister in terms of their ability and what they're actually trying to do. But anyway, yeah, we can. that's an Irish discussion. But yeah, it's coming to a cinema near us. That's why we're interested. That's why we're interested and so interested still in what's going on in America because you're supposed to be the, the, the flagship operation. Literally, what I'm saying to American women all morning, you know, yesterday when I talked to them, and they're kind of saying, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? I didn't realise, and they thought I was being sarcastic. Some people thought I was <laughs> pro-life and I was masquerading as a woman on the internet. And I was like, listen, it float through my mm. fucking Facebook. You'll find quick enough. What I'm saying is, this is what you need to do. But you have to look at what other countries have done. You have to look at what's happening in other countries. You have to then apply what way is their political system different to our own? What different circumstances have they that's going to change it? But you have to learn from other countries. So why is everybody obsessed with America? Because it tends to have an impact on the rest of the world. Imagine we just kick back and go, God, that's awful. And we don't look at, we don't ever discuss. I mean, there's things like the gun thing everybody else finds odd. Okay, but we have to look at how they got so bipartisan, how the QAnon shit set in because again the QAnon shit it took COVID but that that shit started setting in here the far right stuff if you don't look at what's happening elsewhere and try to apply it to your own country and think about what stuff isn't going to fly here that did fly there but how they might get it in here and what would it take if you don't look at that you're a fucking idiot and we have friends you know friends of ours very close friends of ours who got caught up in the whole COVID conspiracy thing you know, and are still digging their heels in about it. And, 
you can find any quack doctor and they find the quack doctor and they say, this is the guy who's, who knows everything about everything. I'm backing him and he's an epidemiologist from wherever. And, you know, OK, but there's also 95 doctors who are saying the exact opposite. Yeah, but it, oh, well, that's just big business and that's just big pharma and blah, blah, blah. They're saying and like COVID comes and goes and we open up the doors again. And they have to go into their hell, oh, well, you know, and they're just still fucking jabbing away with their bullshit. But you know? it still comes down to this climate that we're all in. And it's, 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 it was very much America first and it's worse in America. But we're all with the Internet. We're all living in this climate where... Mm. Pick your fucking team. You don't give up for love nor money. It's cognitive dissonance. You find the facts that suit you, whatever figures suit you, but you dig in because if you step even slightly outside bounds, your own people will attack you and the other side's not going to like you. Mm. And that's very fucking convenient for the powers that be, not to be conspiracy theorists about it. But like, what kind of world do we live in? Aside from the fact that I don't think it's reasonable, I don't think it's good, but you can see how easily we can be taken advantage of if we pick a team and we don't ask any questions no matter what you pick your fucking team that's right there's no doubt that you know we even talked about it last last show about climate change and how you know capitalism is the issue because it's just going to keep burning stuff and we're keep we're going to keep buying stuff and we're going to keep wanting stuff and until we reduce supply as a number of airlines flying from dublin to london it's not going to make any bit of a difference and no one allows that because the free market can decide. The free market is what's pushing us into extinction through climate change. So there's no doubt that governments use propaganda mm. and they say things. They we Look at Boris Johnson's government. Just, it's like walking in a minefield. Just Things are blowing up on his face left, right and centre. Lies, 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 lies. But then there's this sort of wacko conspiracy where, you know, Bill Gates is putting chips in our head to control us. And that gets equal merit. The hearing on what happened on January 6th is obviously in full flight in America right now and is jaw-dropping. No Trump people are listening to that. It's not being broadcast by Fox. They're poo-pooing and laughing at it. And yet there's a very clear and present case for Donald Trump to be arrested and put in prison for his behaviour. Yeah, you know? and it's just oh well, you know that won't solve anything. It will solve something. It means you can't. Do yeah, that. but like any time you have a discussion, whether it be American centric or just a global issue, any time you have a discussion on the internet with Americans, they, they will say to you, they don't even look to see what country you're from. They say, oh, you obviously watched that from CNN. Yeah, and you're going no, because hard as this might be for you to believe, in other countries we have unbiased media. Now, of course. There are certain yeah. medias that tend to lean this way and that way. And no, oh, nobody's yeah. nobody's perfect, right? I get that. But they don't grasp the idea that even when you turn on the TV channel, you have to pick a team. Mm. And that's what you're going to hear. And I don't, I don't care. I only want to hear that. It doesn't occur to them that what they're saying is completely fucking stupid. Because, sorry, I'm not American. We actually have news. <laughs> we don't just have propaganda channels. We have issues with them. Sometimes we think they're shite. But we do actually have news. Well, I mean, it might be worth playing a clip here because a good instance of this has happened in the last week over here in Ireland and the UK, where the UK, the UK, my view on the on the Brexit thing is that the UK is eventually going to have to rejoin Europe. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but I think it's just absolutely car crashing. So you, the UK is now entering a summer of strikes, rail are coming out, lawyers are coming out, nurses, teachers. The whole thing is looking like it's going to become very problematic for whatever government's in power. But there's this guy called Mick Lynch, and he's the spokesman for one of the big trade unions. And, you know, to the Don's point about we have over here unbiased media, there's a lot of biased media. Murdoch owns most of the Of rags. course, yeah. And Sky News, which is probably the CNN of the UK, although it's right-wing leaning rather than left-wing leaning. And it's amazing when when I was growing up, Thatcher and Reagan were the two people who broke unions, miners mm. in the UK and air traffic controllers in America. And I grew up with a very sort of a free market, capitalist, neoliberal dad who, who believed in the market and making money and you can make as much money as you like and unions are just... And by the way, unions were corrupt and they were full of fucking arseholes and whatever. So it, it wasn't like the unions were some sort of no, much maligned thing, but they did smash the unions or reform them, as they called, to the point where unions became a lot less powerful, but they're still quite powerful. And... It's just a line of questioning. So when, when the union guy goes on Sky, he's, he's, he's assumed to be a baddie and, mm. you know, he's disrupting people going racing and he's disrupting this. Are your members going to just pick it? And 
it's worth maybe listening to just a little clip of him just dealing with the sort of right wing questioning that's designed to try and trip up. And he had no truck with it. He just steamrolled over politicians. Full time jobs who are having to take state benefits and use food banks. That is a national disgrace. What will they do if agency workers try to cross those picket lines? Well, we will picket them. What do you think we'll do? We run a picket line and we'll ask them not to go to work. You can see what picketing involves. I can't believe this line of questioning. Picketing is standing outside the workplace to try and encourage people who want to go to work not to go to work. What else do you think it involved? You've also lied that we left negotiations on Saturday and went to a rally. There were no negotiations scheduled for Saturday. You are a liar. The pensions of our members are going to be decimated. They're going to make us poorer not only while we're at work, but poorer in retirement. And that's an agenda that the government has got because they want to subsidise the private sector in this country as they are doing in the health service which is being consumed by the private sector, as they've done in the education service, which is being consumed by the private sector. He should be apologising to the doctors and nurses who can't get to hospital, the patients who can't get their operation, the kids who miss out on their education today, but also those armed forces veterans who risk their lives for our freedoms, who won't be able to celebrate Armed Forces Day on Saturday. Do you want to apologise for all that, Mick? Well, I think Jonathan should apologise for talking nonsense. None of that is true. And you're a liar. What the rest of the country suffers from is the lack of power. The lack of the ability to organise and the lack of the wherewithal to take on these employers that are continually driving down wages and making the working class in this country poorer year on year on year, while the rich get richer. Now, I welcome anyone that wants to join us on our picket lines and show us messages of support. All right, well, you're if more... Keir Starmer can't do that, that's a, a, th a problem for him, not for us. I don't want people to be, Good to know uh, are going to be left and I want a settlement to this dispute. I can't do that with a backbench MP who's just learned it off a script. And one of the reasons we're not affiliated is because Labour politicians since Blair have not identified with working class people. And failing to do that is one of the problems they've got in working class communities. And they've left the door open to populists and others to come into the situation. The Labour Party is about supporting working people, or it should be, not triangular, triangulating uh, from uh, opinion makers such as the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and the Times. So they've got to sort out their identity and they've got to come up with a set of policies. There are lower paid people and there are wealthy people in this society. And what's wrong in this society is that there is an imbalance between the people that do the work to keep this country going, who create the wealth of our civilization and don't get a fair share of that wealth because it's going to people who are vastly wealthy. Wait. Labour should be comfortable with backing working class people who are struggling. And one of the ways that they can redress the imbalance is through industrial action where negotiations fail. What else are we to do? Are we to plead? Are we to beg? We want to bargain for our futures. We want to negotiate. And if we're not bargaining, you have to beg. And I don't want any working class people in this country to have to beg the employers for a decent living. And Keir Starmer shouldn't want that either. Yeah, he's become a bit of a hero to Irish people in the past week. He's all over TikTok. He also... Um, he said he's half Irish, yeah. It's yeah, but he also so. quoted James Connolly as his political hero. So James Connolly? Was a union man and uh, he was the man behind the lockout. Great strike of Dublin. Yeah. He was executed in Kilmainham this time to a chair. So <laughs> naturally, there's all sorts of uh, the, the horror. The woman who was interviewing me at the time, her face with horror and wanting to just, I didn't even see what she said back because it cut off, but she was just, bup, 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 bup. how could he possibly? Because he made, he, and there was a little glint in his eye when he said, an Irish Republican revolutionary <laughs> watching for her reaction. Yeah. It was quite entertaining. But you can hear this guy. So, you know, there's this, there's this kind of polity. I don't know whether that's the right word. This kind of uh, politesse, maybe of news gathering where you come in and you're asked a question and you fudge the answer as a politicians normally do and the the interviewer lets you away with it or maybe presses you a couple of times for a yes or no answer and it goes on like that the rules of engagement are not you're lying as he just said there you're lying that's a lie hmm. the rules of engagement from journalists are not that they're not allowed to do that they, they're afraid they won't get anyone back if they tell them that they're a liar live on air and the way this guy is just 
presenting himself like it's a picket line that's what pickets do you stop people from going across like, you know and she's like trying to instill oh is it going to be violence so you got you know we're going to have to have the police out. Yeah. you know is it going to be like the miners strike and that's Kay Burley and Kay Burley's an absolute yeah, she wagon she's a fucking wagon and she's totally in the pot pay pack packet of of this sort of right wing pretend to be uh i mean Fox is just on it. Fox is like a kind yeah. of a, fic- a fictional TV. It's like the day-to-day. Yeah. And then CNN, you know, you kind of go, okay, yeah, CNN have been caught out on a few things and you kind of, you go shame on you and all this kind of mm. stuff and because they purport, Wolf Blitzer and all these guys, they purport to be honest brokers and I think they are more honest brokers. And I think they are, but they're working within a system where it's just, everything is propaganda. And not just because they tend to say more of what I think, but I do see a, a sincere effort to protect journalism and to try and get it right within a system where it's perfectly reasonable that you kind of pick your side and you say whatever the fuck you like it can be hard to self-regulate and it it can be hard not to get carried away with hyperbole and things like that and they have at times but they also have pulled themselves back and kind of worn it and said look we've said such and such shouldn't have done that not we're not the journalism that we want to be doing so i have to give that a nod because it's very easy to have a hugely high standard for journalism when that's the norm very hard when you're on a totally different playing field I mean I remember talking to you remember remember during Trump's regime I was uh, listening to Sean Hannity you know on my walks and I was like and I can't listen to the guy anymore it's just ridiculous and mm. that's like you know millions of people listen to Sean Hannity hang on his every word and all his bullshit and like Tucker Carlson is the new Sean Hannity and he's just worse and they believe him and he is shameful and shameless in what the stuff he says. He's banging a swill bucket and he, I think he knows he is. Yeah, I, I do think that most people listening to him also are kind of aware that they're, well, they're, they're aware that they're willfully going with the cognitive distance. They think they're on the right side of it, mm. but they wouldn't be happy with any kind of question asking that wasn't the right sort of question asking. No more so than on the left. I grew up in the 90s and it was Ireland and it was things were not great and we weren't as progressive as we wanted to be. But I looked at probably more your generation's values and I looked at what feminism was like, anti-racism. I, I grew up when first people of colour came to Ireland and I was watching like that's, you know, what you're hearing your parents or people like that saying, that's not cool. I was looking with awe at some of the values that I was seeing and on American TV and stuff like that, the progressive values, the pro-union anti-racism, pro-feminism, pro-everybody and fairness. And one of the virtues that kind of stuck with me was that you protect journalism at all costs, mm. that, that freedom of speech, journalism is important. State, yeah. yeah. And it's like that has completely fallen away. Yeah. It doesn't matter what side you're on. What matters is I will defend to my dying day your right to be wrong. <laughs> like you can have an opinion. And even within that, Okay, now we live in an, in an internet world, so it, even that can't be black and white because you can't have absolute free speech. There has to be a line somewhere and who decides where the line is. Well, certainly calls for violence. We won't allow that. But we have to allow people to have opinions that we don't like. Yeah. And like, when you say that, usually you're talking about a specific issue and then people kind of get to dismiss that. They go, yeah, but you're talking about me and that's just because you think this. We have to be able to listen to people that we don't like where they're coming from. We don't like their opinion. We can have levels of a certain amount of civility has to be had in the discourse or you'll be cut off. And I mean, like that brings us to, in Ireland, we had a bit of a foray with our national broadcaster because there's a famous programme called Joe Duffy Liveline and people come in and it's people call in. It's a radio talk show. It's a radio. Afternoons. Yeah, people call in and give out about whatever shite. It's running years. But anyway, uh, there was a discussion about an Irish maternity bill that's being updated and the word mother and stuff, is, it, that the, the, it's being gender neutral terms. That's how the discussion started. And so the discussion kind of got into a lot of trans issues and some conflicting rights. And there, there were some football coaches that were totally not affiliated with any groups and that were talking about their concerns and what they're trying to do. And some of the, you know, so the discussion was had. Now, Joe Duffy, I not, might not be a fan of him, but he did a very good job of, it was very much a civil discourse. Nobody was allowed to be rude or to be nasty or to, to use unpleasant terms. He Like, he would cut you off quick enough. You won't behave yourself. Mm-hmm. Everyone had to behave. But people expressed their opinions or their concerns and a discussion was had but there were so many complaints after that and, and obviously it was, it was Pride yesterday in Dublin and Dublin Pride last week uh, terminated their partnership with RT who's our broadcaster over this and now our, we have a Oireachtas committee calling in RT to explain themselves as to how they lost the partnership and I'm kind of going 
You yeah. see, it doesn't matter what they were talking about. But likewise, I was there when we were discussing reproductive rights and I had to listen to horrible shit being said. I was there at the TV station in RT amongst women who'd had terminations for fatal fetal ab- abnormality. So very well, much wanted children that they lost and were devastated, but the child would have been crushed within them. So they had to travel to have that termination. Mm. And I watched as pro-life people hissed and spat at us and called us names, including mm. those women who were coming in talking about much wanted babies and how to, how, how this is important to handle yeah. sense, like horrific shit but I would never have advocated that we didn't have that discussion I mean I'm sure it was nasty for gay people to listen to when we had we were the first country to have by popular vote marriage equality there was a lot of discussions about whether it's right to have you know children growing up in gay households and stuff like that and before that being gay was decriminalised in the 90s so there were an awful lot of discussions where gay people had to sit there and listen to their their who they are and their lives being dissected and, and, and it disrespect and they listened to that all along and that wasn't nice but I do think it's really fucking important that we have to have discourse mm. including people having odious opinions yeah. and again what is an odious opinion the fact that in my opinion the trans movement has hijacked and is so ridiculously dogmatic about what is offensive and where they're taking offense and who's a transphobe and this has been going on for five or six years. It's been going on the duration of this podcast. And I've been sticking to my guns mm. apart from the middle time I didn't. And come at me if you want, because there's no part of me that doesn't believe that trans people need to be looked after and cared for and treated as equal. But if you're going to start ramming fucking cocks down my throat in, in women's sport or in, 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 in society and telling me that men dressed as women are allowed to compete in women's sports or sporting things or whatever... You know, we're going to get a pushback on that. That's nothing to do with the fact that people who have got gender dysphoria or who are trans in whatever way should not be equally cared for and looked after as normal people. There's no such thing as normal people in my view. But if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to be a Muslim coming at me with, with your dogma, I'm going to react. And everyone's terrified of this thing. But I I think my point on this, regardless of where I stand on any of those issues, the point is, even if somebody whose main issue is trans women in sports and they can, they're concerned that it's unfair or whatever, uh, even assume they're entirely wrong. Assume, assume they're totally wrong in their position. Okay, but it is disingenuous and it's a bad faith argument to suggest that anybody who holds that opinion or who wants to have that discussion is hateful and is bigoted and wants trans people not to have a right to exist. I think that's disingenuous. I think very few people actually deep down believe that. I think it's a shutdown of argument. I think there are lots of arguments that are bullshit, but it's not fair to assume. And I also believe gay people have a right to marry. But I don't actually think that everybody who might have been against gay marriage wants gay people to be harassed and abused. I disagree with their position, but I think it would be disingenuous, like the pro-life thing. I will take apart every argument because it's really important to me. But I don't think that every person who might have been inclined to vote against reproductive justice hates women and it's just about that they want they want us all to die in dangerous abortions i don't think that's true mm. i think when you take apart the argument and have the debate have the debate if your if your point is solid you'll have the debate terms like debating our right to exist no one's debating your right to exist it's ideology and they might be wrong but i i think it's bullshit to use this hyperbole as a way of shutting down any and all discussion yeah and if there's a vote that comes out amongst the people of ireland or any country that says you know, do you believe that trans women should be allowed to participate in, just to take one issue, should be allowed to participate? And everyone says, yeah, we do. I'll go along with that. I won't go onto the street beating a drum. I'll go, OK, fine, let's see how that works out for you. But, you know. I just noticed that every other group had to sit there through a discussion about their rights. How do you mean? Well, women had to sit there. Where? In history. In history. Yeah. We all had to sit through people saying awful things about yeah. us and we had to we had to sit there and, and yeah. pedal out our... And I'm not saying that was nice, but this brave new world, and it doesn't matter whether it's on the left, and, and trans issues seem to be the biggest one at the moment. There's also the critical race theory discussions. Yeah. There's also stuff on the right. But the point is, we all had to explain our position. Mm-hmm. And it's not fun, it's not easy, but we all had to do it. And I absolutely believe that we shouldn't have hatred on the airwaves but hatred is not just an odious opinion hatred is when we're inciting violence when we're exactly. if, if we're if we can't be civil somebody can be civil to me and deeply insulting i can be deeply insulted yeah. and rightfully so but there's as long as somebody is going to sit on a stage and not swear at me not shout at me then to an extent suck it up mm-hmm. because and we all have to and it's important for a society we, we can because look even if you have to set aside what's in your heart sometimes and go, yeah, but logically, because 
we lived in a country where it, it was theocracy and, and when the idea any ideology being right and no questions asked are allowed because then you're a bad person then you're a sinner mm. that's a problem mm. even if your ideology is is generally right about most things even if your heart's in the right place it's dangerous that the things that I agree with I'm not going to have questioned because next time it might be something that's really important no, and there I, has to be a standard I've always been coming you know this I've always been coming at it from the threat to comedy to take it away from maybe the f- inflammatory trans and, and uh racist thing you know but equally serious in ireland we have a the the traveling community here are much maligned and they're not looked after and they have very high suicide rates and they have very low rates of education they're shunned by people and they're called knackers and have been all my life yeah been much maligned but i lost a friend who is involved in the travelers movement because i took the piss out of a bunch of travelers who were going around Europe nicking rhino horns. We've had this on the conversation on the mm. podcast before. She didn't find that funny, stormed out of a restaurant, never spoke to me again. And by the way, there's a, a very f- interesting documentary on, on this subject on Netflix. I'm not sure whether it's on Netflix in America, but it's called Knuckle. And it's a documentary that's been 10 years in the making. And it's probably about five years old, but Netflix have put it up. And it's about bare knuckle fighting in the traveler community in Ireland. And it is fucked in the nut. All right. A gang of men down a country lane, and you know what? They put a hundred and forty grand on a on a bare knuckle fight. Okay, one hundred and forty grand. These are people who are complaining that they don't have any money to build toilets and 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 improve halting su- sites, but they can find a hundred and forty grand from somewhere to put in a satchel and give to some other guy in their cultural community for beating the shit out of another guy over some fucking cousin's dispute that's going back over a fucking horse twenty years ago. And we're not allowed to take the piss out of that, please. I'm, as I'm listening to you, and I see where you're coming from, but I'm also hearing the word they, and I'm kind of going, okay. They, yeah, because no, okay. it's not, it's, it's not I like know. the travellers are fighting the, the people. settled people. I mean, it's not between those two. It's okay, between but the travellers. They, I think like the point, and it's very easy when we say they, we, we do that a lot, but it's like to break that down, there's a difference between discussing a specific group of people who belong to a mar- marginalised community mm-hmm. and discussing that issue and not be kind of being told, oh, you can't because that's targeting, a, 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 you know, that we have to be able to discuss issues, whether it's a trans thing, whether it's a gay thing, whether it's a race thing, whether it's a traveller thing. We have to be able to discuss an issue. We can be wrong about it, but we have to be able to dis- respectfully discuss, discuss an issue without being told that's off the table because you're touching an untouchable group. Mm. Uh, but That's but within that, I have to say, I've noticed a lot of white saviorism in Ireland in terms of traveller rights, mm. in that an awful lot of people that are kind of very far left, just looking for woke points, speaking, you know, to use one of their phrases, speaking over travellers. But I like to waste time on TikTok a lot. And I come across traveller TikTok, which I fucking love, right? Mm. Because the girls, the young ones on traveller TikTok are funny. They're brilliant. They do great little sketches. They do the best like house hacks and the best cooks and all that. Like, I actually just enjoy it. I, you know, when, and the algorithm sets it. So I've, I've found loads of these, but they do get a lot of comments just out of nowhere. It might be nothing to do with their background. They're just talking about this and my mommy's recipe for such and such. This is how I make it for people who asked. And within that, you get ourselves coming on, calling them all sorts of names, attacking them. And I'm like, hang on, this girl's allowed to have a TikTok. But I notice that the way in which they handle it is spectacular they can have a laugh they'll be able to, to rise above it and I kind of think it's it does a disservice to travellers when we see the same kind of squealing leftists speaking over them and white savouring them mm-hmm. when in fact yes there are, there are huge problems within the travel community there's a lot of problems in terms of violence uh, but I think especially it's, bare knuckle violence well and violence against women and stuff I know, but I, I know. but I, I think I, I'm slow to again travellers are much maligned and yes there are problems within the community and when you marginalise community that's what happens yeah. I don't want to again you don't tar, tar, tar all travellers with the same brush no, but I the, find it interesting that when we're doing the white saviour shit we kind of are tarring them all with the same brush and we're no, not, not allowing not, we're not allowing not you but people who are trying yeah. to rescue them okay. we're not allowing for them to have the autonomy to speak up for themselves and in fact certainly the travel women I've come across are well able to I mean I talked about there was a, there's one clip in that documentary on this I think he looks about 14 years of age and by the way, this is not just a small, this is all, it's not hashtag all travellers, but like, it's like nine different families and there's like 60 guys turn up for the bare knuckle fight and there's five different bouts 
on a road and they can kick the shit out of each other into submission. It's a widespread And they probably go, this is part of our culture. Well, fine, but we're allowed to take the piss out of it in 2022 that you can get 140 grand in a satchel and, and go down a country lane on a Saturday and have a fight about some bullshit, right? And it, there's, there's, if that was in the settled community, if that was some fucking county in Ireland, they would have that fucking piss ripped out of them by most people who are going, what the fuck is that about? But there was a little boy or a teenage boy looking at it. There's just this picture in his face and he's going, what the fuck am I doing in this situation? Yeah. And it's grandparents, it's generational, it's passed down, they can call it culture. I, but like, I I would hope, uh, I'm not sure, that the many travellers in Ireland are mortified by that fucking yeah. documentary. Mortified. By yeah, and I think there are a lot of traveller families that go in for their Sunday lunch and are turned away and they've We've dressed they've dressed their kids up nicely. They take their Sunday a lot more seriously yeah. than we do. And that's yeah. fucking horrific to watch their parents and themselves be be um treated like that yeah. to, to go into school and I, I went to school with travellers and I remember like, you know, Knacker is the it's a slur. It'd be the slur for travellers. Mm-hmm. Like when I was growing up in very working class community, people go, eh, knacker, meaning eh, disgusting. And they weren't talking about travellers. Yeah. But so you'd be in the girls' bathrooms and somebody, this was something nasty in the bathroom, someone go, eh, knacker. And I often remember like coming across these travel girls and they burst into tears. They go, don't use that word. That's a terrible word. And it really caused some genuine mm-hmm. hurt. But the reaction within my school was people, the people who had said it were, were quite embarrassed and went, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, but I won't use it again. And that was the bottom line, end yeah. of. There's I think there's two of- uses of the word, which we can come back to at a later date. But one of the most knackers are it's in the settled community and there's some gee bags who are at nicking shit or having fights or setting off, uh, or shooting each other in gang violence. That's the, the other meaning of it the word. It is the other meaning, in although Dublin. in fairness though, right? Where did that meaning come from? So like the it other- It come from travellers. It did. The other, yeah. the, so the other meaning for knacker, when it's used as like scumbag, scanger, chav, thug, whatever yeah. you have, the, you might not be thinking of travellers at all, but then you go, okay, but how do we start using the word for travellers to describe somebody who's a scumbag because we're insinuating that the worst thing it could be is to be like a traveller. That kind of is where it came from. Well, it came from someone who kills horses, right? No, so. I know, but the, the usage of it to mean a horribly uncultured person or, or somebody to look down on was you were using the word for a traveller because mm-hmm. you're calling them a traveller. That's the worst insult you could call them. That's so in fairness, it's like, yeah, shouldn't use that word in that context. I, I think the point is we should be able to no matter what a group is, we should be able to see a piece of news and go, that's fucking disgraceful. I have no problem when something bad, or like whether it's a bare knuckle boxing thing or, yeah. or horses have been badly kept. If that's on a news article, I have no problem when I scroll down and I see lots of comments saying that's fucking disgraceful, they should be ashamed of themselves. My problem is when it's, that's fucking disgraceful, they should be ashamed of themselves, what do you expect? I'm sick of travellers and then there's a rant about travellers. Yeah. We sh- that nobody should be immune to, to commentary yeah. if they've done something bad. I have a problem with... So the same way if it was a black group that had, had done something and we if they happen to be a black group, we, we say that's fucking disgraceful. I can't believe they did that. Absolute scumbags. I have a problem when it then turns into a rant about people of colour. Right. But if I, I did a, if I did a comedy sketch and I dressed up as a traveller and I was shouting down a YouTube thing telling Jim Joe to come and fight me down a country lane we have 120 grand, or I, and it was just a, a skit, okay? Mm. I get into trouble. Yeah. Okay? But what I'm doing is a skit on something that's actually real and yeah. happening. I say, if it's fucking out there, it's fair ball for someone to take the piss out of. And I don't care whether you're the president of Ireland or the king of Thailand, because you're not allowed to take the piss out of him either, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you're fair ball and, and, and get over it. Yeah, but that comes back to wh- whether it's a comedy Take issue or not. Take the out of me but, for being a sort of middle but, class fucking twat of the year. I, you know, yeah, but, but like, my point is like even if you take the comedy thing out of it, it still comes back to the point I made earlier that I don't think anybody should be immune to commentary and I think it's bad faith and disingenuous to say yes, but this group is untouchable or that group is untouchable. I do have a problem with hatred directed to a group but at the same time criticism directed to individuals should not be barred because they are members of a particular group sure. and that's fucking bad faith yeah and i think this is what's happening with the left the left is it's almost pushing it's pushing itself on so many levels so far that most sane people are going you're all going insane it's totalitarianism doesn't matter whether it's left or right the point is totalitarianism and we have to have a level of civility yes there have to be consequences and when it comes to cancer culture yeah there have to be consequences if you start go spouting horrible shit you know it should come back to hit you in the face get used to it and people say cancel culture doesn't exist. It does to an extent. But even if you take out the cancel culture, but the actual trying to stop certain discussions being had, trying to take them off the airwaves, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with the idea that you can't criticise people because of their membership of a group. You shouldn't be able to criticise 
the fact that they are members of a group, whether it be gay, trans, black, you shouldn't be able to criticise and attack a minority group. But you certainly should be able to criticise people who belong to a minority group. And that yeah. fucking shield I have a problem with. It's yeah. just cutting down discourse. The same applies to Islam, you yeah. know, treatment of women. We, we've had that on the podcast before. And, you know, even on this podcast, it's like, you know, you kind of come away from your editing the next day, going, oh, maybe I should take that out yeah. or whatever, and we get into trouble. I mean, I, the, the, the the people on the extreme left and the ex- people on the extreme right, the white supremacist, torch-burning, hood-wearing, racist thugs, and those on the extreme left are the two groups that are closest together. Yeah, because they're both totalitarian. They're both big Fascist, into right yeah, think. Yeah. They're both big into, you say anything outside the realm, we're going to attack you. It's going to be ad hominem attacks. We're going to attack your decency as a person. We're going to attack your intelligence. Yeah. Absolutely everything. But we're not going to debate the point with you. Hmm. Anyway, what else has been going on? Oh, one of the things that uh, I, I watched, uh, speaking of, of some of those topics we talked about, was I, and I know neither of us are big into James Bond, and I know I'm coming late to this party, is No Time to Die, which is Daniel Craig's last James Bond, which came so out in 2021. And you remember it was postponed for launch because of COVID? Vaguely. Well, actually, one of the reasons, I think, is that it's got a virus, and they never mentioned the word virus. They've obviously cut the word virus out. They have this virus, a new weapon that Britain has been developing that's gone into the wrong hands. And what it does is it kills everybody based on their DNA. So you can walk into a room and kill all white people and leave all black people. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can plug in their DNA and it'll leave everybody else so Normal. a certain aspect of DNA they can yeah. find you. So that was one of the reasons. But the, so it's like a genocide thing. Yeah, yeah. And James Bond is, is no longer working for Britain. He's working for the CIA. His place has been taken by a black woman who's now 007. He's got a kid. that He finds out he has a kid. Miss Moneypenny, and I may be, I've missed this memo many years ago, is black, a black woman as well. A person of colour, maybe I'll say black, I don't know. Um, and he's not such a fucking smug cunt. Uh, the Lothario thing is kind yeah, of... Yeah, so... And it so was, I have it to point out, I've actually never seen a James yeah, Bond I remember movie. Yeah, So yeah, I just, yeah. for clarity, I mean, I'm familiar now with the general... it's two hours, 43 minutes That's long, why I probably why I've never seen it. so ridiculous. Uh, but also the third highest yeah, grossing movie of all time in Britain. Wow. Which is saying something. And then the other thing, of course, is that I don't have prostate cancer. <gasps> Congratulations. So I had my first, saying it was my first finger of my hole would be lying, but it was my first medical finger of my <laughs> hole. Recently, I had to go through this, no, I wouldn't call it a scare, but a kind of my, my first brush with have you or have you not got prostate cancer. One of my good buddies has it and had to have his prostate removed, which was, which stung a bit, shall we say, but it seems to have been successful. One in eight men get it. I'm not here trying to do an ad for getting your prostate checked out, but it is a very nice feeling uh, not the finger up the bum but the feeling when you find out maybe that you might be okay for another few years um, but I, when I was getting it done I was uh, you know it's like the, the, the guy who has to do it like what a fucking job yeah well I'm every sure they're paid day, enough well okay but like every day going in and sort of having to yeah pro- a proctologist I think the word is so how, like, um, because we've been talking about women's health it's interesting to bring up the whole men's health yeah. thing because you're what 53 54 next yeah. week Jesus. You'll be in Denmark for that, so we report back from Denmark. Yeah. So, I mean, how? because obviously there's been there's always been a thing about men's health and men maybe not talking about stuff enough. How Has that changed, or do you think your your people are representative, your, the people you're around are representative? Because I think it's interesting the fact that you chose to bring that up. I think there's probably an awful lot of men that it wouldn't take a huge amount to push them, but because it's not being talked about, they won't. But if they're pushed, they kind of go, oh, maybe I should do that. I think it's moving in the right direction. I mean, certainly my generation is ahead of my father's generation. His generation is probably ahead of his. And I'm sure the generation below me are better about it. I mean, there was a macho thing where men tend to just brush off little complaints yeah. and not get seen to. And women always get them seen to because they usually have to take care of children. And that was a, a reason. But I think men are more, you know, they look after themselves more than they did. And part of that is looking after your health. But... You know, one in three of us is going to get cancer. So if it's not me and it's not you, then it's Rex. <laughs> Rex is one of our stuffed toys. But um, yeah, so it's just good to, to, to go through. And it wasn't that problematic. There's a blood test and then there was, some, you know, you go in and you get checked out. And um, certainly they, they recommend it for men in their mid-50s onwards to go and get it done. So if you haven't 
maybe have a think about doing that. Um, and it, it got me thinking, though, when I was in there, because, you know, one of the things when you're going in for that exam is, and I'm sorry if we're going to get a little bit uh, scatological here, is that you have to, you have to kind of... Clear things out. Yeah, and you have to make sure it's all kind of thick and span, and, you know, not that it isn't. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you're kind of worried about poo and things like that, and it's like, you know... <laughs> it's, it's it, so funny because I think, do you know what it is? Obviously, there, there's the women's aspect, like we've to have breast check, we've to have cervical checks, mm, but... In the stirrups. Yeah. Like, I, I was having my first baby, I was 20. I hadn't had any cervical checks or any shit like that. Then you go in and you're like, oh my God, I'm I'm going to have to, like, have strangers. And then be like, they'd have students marching in and out yeah. and, like, curtains pulled across and, oh my God. And it's like, especially when you're younger, it's like, oh my God. But the di- I, I, I suppose I noticed the difference is for many women, not all, but for many women, we go through pregnancy and childbirth before we go through all the like difficulties of getting old and having to get checkups. And there comes a point so where, used to it. well, we're so desperate because the, like everybody, wor- like uh, nearly every woman worries at some point, what if I shit when in labour? Because that happens. Mm-hmm. Like people shit giving birth and it's fucking mortifying. And this, this occupies a really strange amount of space in our heads when we're pregnant, aside from everything else. And then you're like, you already feel crap like like where you might have been shy about the whole legs and not only are people going to be looking at your downstairs furniture but if you've got legs and stirrups that's so unflattering and you've yeah. put on weight anyway all of these things go through your head and you can barely see down there like oh fuck what if it's untidy but then if I tidy it up am I going to look fucking weird because I'm pregnant and it's like oh what are you doing you know all of this shit <laughs> you know like no one calls you by your name when you're pregnant they call you mum everybody just calls you and, and is mum doing okay and all this kind of shit and you're like so you're, they're going to have to change that terminology. Now. Yeah, but you're going to get you're, you're getting hit with this whole motherhood pregnant. thing of being like Mother Earth and being super mature, but you've never felt more childlike because you lose all autonomy and you realise, yeah, I know, but I can't put this off because baby's going to come. It's quite a huge thing to kind of go, I'm going to have no choice in this, but I'm going to be in trouble and I'm going to need medical help. So you can't you can't just say, excuse me, I'm not ready and clutch your fucking cardigan over closed. By the time you're in labour, should you shit yourself? You really don't give a fuck. You're more concerned about everything splitting open. At that point, you leave your dignity at the door. Yeah. And that's kind of when people worry about an early pregnancy. Anybody older than you or who had kids, just go, listen, leave your dignity at the door. To just And you do. Whereas men haven't had to go through that. So it must be a very strange experience to suddenly be getting down with it in your now, 50s. I was, I was thinking, I was wondering, when did men start wiping their holes? Do you know what I mean? Is that, that, that must have been some sort of, you know, look at Jeff over there. Everyone's sitting there with dock leaves and uh, Jeff's, Jeff's got some sort of papyrus and he's sitting there reading the, reading the Egyptian times on papyrus. <laughs> and, his, his use, uh, and I think it's, it, it, it like, you know, because the weird thing about Egypt is it's 3,000 years ago. Yeah. No, it's, it's 5,000. No, it's still there, but I know what you mean. No, but like, those so times. This, this, and, and, and yet, the, I, th- I think something like the oldest recorded use of people wiping themselves is 6 BC, like it's China time. So, the, but like the, the Egyptians all look like they had their little fucking things and they, they look like the little gold things. I'm sure they cleaned. And, and yeah, but then in the Middle East, they they think we're actually scumbags for our toilet paper yeah, use. Yeah, yeah. They like they actually wash their whole. Well, every that's time. okay too. I mean, I I, I no, just I know, but they think we're dragging icky. yourself across the grass. See, this is every time you talk about this, I get this picture <laughs> of you with your face and body. But like totally negative. Like this is an image I get of you, like in this apartment. But for some reason, there's no carpet in this apartment. But for some reason, in my picture in my head, there's carpet, and you're dragging your hole along yeah. with the big like looking like a cocker spaniel. But each time you have your serious face on, and I'm not sure if you're aware of your serious face, but it's like there you have a face that you pull when you're taking yourself far too seriously, and it's hard not to laugh at. Right. But this is the face you have every time you mention big streaks this. of brown behind. Streaks of brown yeah. behind, and like almost like I won't say anything to him because he'll snap at me. He's got he's in his very I'm taking myself too seriously face. <laughs> but the, first, the the ape that first picked up a dock leaf. You know, it's like, look at Jerry over there, fucking wiping his hole with a dock. Yeah, you but know. the ape that first picked up a dock leaf Probably didn't stick might as much, have been a woman often. that got a sting in the nettles when she was crouching down right. to go in for a piss. I right. did actually get that. Now, that's Sorry, only occurred to me. That I that's only occurred to me because I was now. watching Grey's Anatomy. My eldest has gotten into it, so I'm rewatching all the old stuff. But there's, there is an episode where somebody in it uh, has a big rash. And what happened is she was out with the dog and she was, oh, fuck it, right, I'll just that's go for a piss. to watch. No, I know, but she went for a piss and uh, she ended up being stung by a lot of stuff. So when you said that, I'm like, the first ape is probably, you know, it was probably a female that got stung yeah. and was like wiping a duck. Leaf. Or, you know, the long kind of shuffle to the loo 
post-coital. That might have been the first usage yeah. of, a, of a duck leaf. But maybe the toilet paper thing is a bit like the, you know, women shaving only came into fashion when Jeanette wanted to make more money. So maybe the whole toilet paper thing was just a capitalist ruse. Well, I don't mean toilet paper because, I know, you know but still in India and many Islamic countries, they just use what water and their fingers but is that what everybody it? was doing up until th- I don't know I genuinely no, don't that's what I want to know like, were, were we knuckle dragging ourselves across the grass it's like, ah, for fuck's sake you're wrecking the grass because there was no houses right so you know get out of the cave and do your poo outside and drag yourself across the grass there'll be a bit of grass area which is all street from all the monkeys that have been dragging themselves. they don't go near that it's for flies on it <laughs> but what did we have before toilet paper we probably had like a communal washcloth yeah, there's, uh, you know, the ancient Romans, I think, used sticks and stuff like that. Sticks. Oh, stuff. <laughs> but, like, the person who invented it, you know, or, or the B-Day. I mean, like, the B-Day was a, a hilarious thing growing up for me because when people got bathroom renovations done, they put in a B-Day. Did and, they? And they'd never use it except maybe to wash their underpants in, you know, leave it and soak overnight. But they'd be a B-Day. And you go, every house had a B-Day, but no one was who really using B-day? them. We, uh, we have one at home, like. Oh, my God. <laughs> I forget was, that you were rich. It, it, no, it was like sort of an 80s thing. I know, but bear in mind. France. Okay, but bear in mind, it might have been an 80s thing, but you ha- you can't magic up room in your house. So if you grew up in a two up, no, two bed, no, two no, down, you wouldn't have had room a, in the... No, but you wouldn't have room in the bathroom to yeah, put it in no, even if you had a few quid. So it obviously the, just wasn't... Some of the houses over in... Uh, no, I've, I've, it's not I've honestly... Class, I've, it's no, what I'm saying is I've never seen we've seen one in Ireland. Yeah. But that's because probably where I'm living, there wouldn't have been space to put one in, but we put in decking and shit. Oh like so, uh, and even now in France you don't see B-Days but that was a kind of but then Japan is a very B-Day but yeah. they have a B-Day built into the toilet I was about to say it's all the rage now yeah. is to visit ho- this, oh, all the rage now is that you get like a hose thing yeah. that you can attach onto your yeah. toilet so you've got a B-Day situation which, well they have yeah. stuff in Japan where you can press a button and it'll come out and you press the warm speed you know and you can just get a nice little <laughs> downstairs it's, good. it's very good Anyway, um, anything else on the agenda? We're go- we, we went to Toulouse for a mini break after our last podcast where we were debating the ethics of Ryanair, which is known, obviously, and whether we should travel or not now that COVID is over, given climate change and the need to reduce supply being the issue. We did go to Toulouse. What did you think of Toulouse? Uh, it was beautiful, mm. but it was hot as Balls. Yeah, I was hitting 41. Toulouse is... Was it higher uh, than that fourth, at one stage? 41 or 2, yeah. I thought it was like 47 at one no, point. No, it doesn't get that. No, uh, but I'm getting it, that it was It was 37 and 41. Oh, it was 37 and 41, 40, yeah. Toulouse is the fourth biggest city in France, down south, not far from the border with Spain and Andorra. It is beautiful. Airbus is the big employer there, but it, it is quaint. And what, what are the things that we noticed? Uh... It was really chill. It's beautiful. It's known as the Pink City. It's an awful lot of red brick everywhere. Yeah. So it's really, really pretty, as you'd imagine somewhere in the south of France would be. But on top of that is the colour of the brick. That's hugely pretty. And the weather is hot, but it's like, it's, you know, so everything's gorgeous and lovely and people are sitting out and cafe culture and all that. So it's lovely. But what we noticed is that nobody got angry. Yeah. Nobody got pissy. It was just really fucking chill. Everyone was pleasant. Nobody was beeping horns. There were no just... sirens like you hear in Paris all the time. There was no one beeping a car horn. In fact, I think I heard a siren once yeah, there. Yeah. And it might have been an ambience or something going by, but I, I remember hearing it. That's how yeah. infrequent it was. Everyone was just really calm. Although the one thing I did notice was that my Jesus, nobody gets out of the way for anybody. And But it wasn't like, they were much more friendly and warm and sincere than in Paris. It wouldn't be quite so friendly. I was watching this with interest that, you know, when you're kind of, certainly in Ireland anyway, you know, if you're about to pass somebody on the footpath and it's a bit narrow, we do this awkward dance as to mm. which direction we're going to go. And it's kind of, oh, Jesus, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. What to do. Yeah, but it's like, it's not that we particularly give a shit about the other person. You just wouldn't want to seem rude or you wouldn't want to plough ahead. One thing I noticed is absolutely everywhere. They would leave the door swinging in your face. They would shove in front of you. There'd be no little dance as to, oh, no, you go ahead. Okay, but I mean, it's very unfair because I think relatively speaking to French people, they're really friendly. Yeah, but I found that I, like, I, didn't, I didn't come across anyone in the time we were there who was snotty, snarky, short with us, bad tempered. Everyone was absolutely lovely. So I don't think this was, I just, it was just an interesting cultural difference I noticed because nobody was in any way unfriendly or yeah. people were, people were killed being nice, but I just noticed nobody gets out of your way. It's or actually nobody. a region, that, you know, it's a special region called Occitan or Occitan. Occitan. Occitan and the Occitanes or the Tannies are very proud of their kind of cultural heritage and they, they, they speak a different language to normal people in France. So the French people know them by their accent, which is rare in France, apparently. 
and uh, yeah, I, it, it, it is moving I know, or my... they say "ach" instead of "we." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have a. Uh, they moved into my top ten of places I yeah. would like to live in. Really pretty place, really nice place. I found yeah. the people just gorgeous, like yeah. really, really sad. So full marks to Toulouse um, and lovely airport, and no problems apart from Ryanair, of course, who were there making an absolute wreck of everything that they touch. Um, I think that's a podcast. Um, we're going to Denmark next Saturday, so we will. The next time we you hear from us, we will be able to report back. My first trip ever to Denmark and the Dons, and we're going to be flying into Billund and we're working our way. across Across the islands to Copenhagen. And on the uh, women's reproductive justice issue, a yep. little bit of good news because everything else is depressing as fuck in Ireland. Contraception is going to be made free as of August 2022 for all women between the ages of 18 to 25, which isn't enough, but it's a really fucking huge start. Really huge start. So that's a little bit of good news. A step in the right direction. I'm going to leave you with one of the greatest comics living, Mr. Stuart Lee. All right. God bless. Mind yourselves. Bye. Of town, you don't have to be from a place to understand what I mean. I'm, I mean, I know what the Loch Ness monster is. I'm not from Scotland, but I know what that is. <laughs> a lot of people think the Loch Ness monster doesn't exist, don't they? Actually, now well, I don't know anything about zoology, biology, geology, geography, marine biology, cryptozoology, evolutionary theory. Evolutionary biology, meteorology, limonology, history, herpetology, paleontology, or archaeology. But I think. a dinosaur had got in the lake. <laughs> They'd lived there for a million years, just eating the mud and... <laughs> like, could have done. Maybe there's like a family and I through history became their job to warn it of danger. <laughs> And they had a bagpipe and they would go, <laughs> Loch Ness Monster, look out. The, the scientists are coming. And they, they've got a radar. Go in a crack. So I was at Dalston Junction.